Today I'm going to show you um, a friend that has that runs a museum not too far from uh, where we're located, and it's very interesting. You know, my grandmother uh, owned an old country store when I was a little kid, so I love this kind of stuff. It reminds me of when I was little. It even smells the same. But um, this is an old country store. It used to be an old country store and post office, and now it's a museum that kind of shows some of the history of the area and just some of that old living. There's a lot of stuff in here that I know you will find very interesting, a lot of old traps, a lot of old uh, merchandise that is uh, still around. You can come, I'm going to put the contact information in the uh, description, so if you want it, they do do tours for you know, school field trips, large groups, small groups, individuals, whatever but a lot of interesting stuff in here that I know a lot of the fans will really enjoy. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of his way and let him start showing us some of this cool old, old gadgets. I would like to thank you for coming to visit us, our uh, little museum. Uh, it's located in Big Bend, Louisiana, which is right off of LA 451. Uh, about halfway the distance uh, in Big Bend. This was an old grocery store and a post office and it closed down April 30th, 1994 as United States Working Post Office. And you're welcome to go in the post office part of it. Inside the post office you'll find an old money on a book that actually came from Naples, Louisiana. Naples, Louisiana no longer exists and uh, uh, this one dates back to uh, 1925 and of course I'll tell you more about Naples as we go along. This is an old charge account book when people used to farm like a little 10, 20 acre tract of land. Uh, they would plant corn, corn being used to feed themselves and animals, and cotton. Cotton was actually a cash crop, so whenever they would harvest their cotton, well, they'd come and settle up or pay their bills, however you want to say it. And we have plenty of old mail that was actually left in here from way back. And, of course, uh, right here we have old check writing machine and the old uh, ad machine, the old typewriter. Uh, the Big Bend Post Office was actually established in 1847 and it closed down April 30th, 1994. And this is actually a complete list of the people who were postmasters at that time. And <clears throat> we have plenty of old magazines and stuff and plenty of old books and stuff. And of course we have uh, the old safe right here. And we have uh, the old radio, the old tube type radio, of course. And uh, we have, uh, I like to call her Mom Bell. Now, uh, since it closed down April 30th, 1994, we tried to portray it as a working store in the early 1900s. A working store in the early 1900s really did not have that many big items in it because most of your bigger items were mail order from Sears or Bucks or Montgomery Ward or a way of uh, making a living or providing for your family. One of the ways of providing for your family in the early 1900s was trapping. This right here is actually a bird trap. And the way this would actually work is you would stick this in the ground like so. Of course, I can't stick in the ground, so I have to substitute with this. And it works a lever action like so. This is your trigger mechanism right here. And of course, you would put your corn right here because birds like corn. Now, whenever the bird came to peck the kernel off the cob or even made a mistake in landing it, well, you caught your bird. And the way the story goes, if you had 10 or 12 of these and the quail were run, it didn't take you long to catch your mess of quails. That was a way of feeding your family back then. This one right here is actually a squirrel trap. You can make a rabbit trap the same way. It's just that a rabbit trap would actually be just a little bit wider. And of course, uh, a rabbit likes to see his way out, whereas a squirrel, well, he's used to going into a hollow. This is his hollow right here. And of course, you would bake this with a, uh, corn back here because squirrels like corn and whenever the squirrel went through the hollow to get to the corn back here Well, you would, hit this and, uh, you would catch a squirrel back to the rabbits uh, You would probably put a piece of expansion metal back there because a the rabbit likes to see his way out We have plenty of old tools and stuff. Uh, well, of course the old crust cut saw right here right here or, or as it's better known in French the pas by two around here and of course the old cowbell right here, The coon trap the bear trap and the different types of gigs right here. 
Now, this is the frog grabber uh, that was used back then. And the way this frog grabber would actually work is uh, you would open it up like so. And we're going to use this to play like this is the frog. And you'd reach out there and grab your frog. Well, that's the way it would work back then. Uh, <coughs> right here, uh, we have uh, the old cotton sack. Uh, when people we used to pick that cotton by hand, of course they drug the cotton sack. You know the funniest thing about this cotton sack, every year I offer it to some of the farmers, but they would rather ride it in an air conditioning cotton picker. And, and this was a replica of what a bale of cotton used to look like. Of course it would weigh about five to seven hundred pounds is what it would weigh. Uh, and back here we have some of the old tools. We have the old Model A jacket. And one of the handiest items that was back then was the old flip pump. That was no such thing as aerosol cans. Of course, the folding ruler, you don't hardly see that anymore either. This, I like to tell the kids, this is the first cordless drill that you never had to recharge the battery. Maybe your battery, you know. And uh, we have uh, the old block plane, the old insulators, the barrels and stuff that nails came in. And, and right here, we have the old corn sheller. Uh, told you earlier people planted a lot of corn. Well, they had to break it by hand, then they'd shuck or husk their ear of corn, then they would put it in this right here. This would actually take the kernels off the cob. Once you took the kernels off the cob, well, you could feed the whole grain kernels to the bigger chickens. But if you had some smaller chickens, well, you had to grind it. This is actually a corn grinder. This one will adjust to make like chops to feed your baby chickens, or you can adjust it real, real fine, and it'll make cornmeal. Cornmeal, cornbread, a way of feeding your family back then. Uh, the old fire chief truck, and, and the crock pot. The crock pot was a way of salt and meat and keeping it without refrigeration back then. And there was no such thing as a Mr. Coffee back then. It was the old drip top coffee pot. The, the bucket that was used to get the water out of the ground system. Well, once you got the water out of the ground system, the bucket was usually placed on the kitchen counter with a dipper in it. Everybody drank out the same dipper back then. Nobody had a special glass or anything like that. Those Dutch ovens and stuff right here. Uh, of course, the old cash register right here. Now the old ad machine. Uh, telephone. And this is the ballot box that was used back then. Now, the funniest thing about this this is still a voting precinct, but we don't use the ballot box anymore. We have the electronic type machines back there. Right here, we have a replica of eggs. Eggs were usually brought in to barter for or trade for because money was hard to come by. So maybe they traded the eggs for sugar, coffee, or whatever their needs were. And of course, this is the wrapping paper. There was no such thing as Ziploc bags back then. Everything was wrapped with the wrapping paper and tied with a string back then. Uh, back here, well, people nowadays say Coke bottles, but actually it was either called a pop bottle or a soda bottle is what it was called back then. Now, right here, we have the top of the line model Maytag washing machine, a 1929 model. But look at it close because it doesn't have an electric motor on it. It's got a gasoline engine on it. That was before electricity. I like to tell the guys and the gals riding the harness, just think that little old lady, she was kicked off her washing machine back then. Right here we have the different old medicines and stuff. And of course, uh, this is the hair clippers that was used back then. Can you imagine using this all day long cutting hair? You must have had carpal tunnel or barber tunnel syndrome <laughs> or probably arms like Popeye the Sailor Man. But this right here is the curling iron that was used back then. This is the cut. The way this would actually work is you would put this on the wood heater or the wood stove and you would let it get hot. You don't want it to get too hot because it would burn your hair. Now be careful now. Don't touch your ear. You're going to burn your ear and wrap your hair around this and hold it till your hair would curl. So that, that was the way this was actually used. Uh, over here we have little wooden boxes because wood Boxes were basically made out of wood back then because cardboard really hadn't made a big day view yet. And we have the old ice cream freezer right here, the old butter churns, and uh, we have the old canning jars, the different old arms right here, and uh, the old canned goods and stuff that was used back then. And, and this right here was the boxes and stuff that cheese came in. And of course, this would be your cheese cutter right here. And no electric motor here. You had to adjust your slice of cheese and then come down to cut your slice of cheese. Uh, 
the cigarette roll that was used to maybe roll your Prince Albert or your bugle or whatever, and a chewing tobacco cutter. Now, right here, people nowadays say kerosene, but actually it was called a colloid lantern is what it was called back then. And, of course, uh, the younger generation, they want to say that's a CD, but that was the old records that was used back then. And, of course, all old hats and stuff that all men wore to church on a Sunday back then, and there was no such thing as a barber dial. It was a rack dial that was used back then. And the old sewing machine, and of course the, the old material, the old all cloth material. And this right here, I really don't like to think this is very old. But you don't see them anymore, an old A-track tape player. And the reason it's not that very old, because that is the one I had in my pickup truck when I was a teenager. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to start off by telling you where you're at. If you actually came in from Mooreville, turned off of LA-1 and came down LA-451, you travel 16 miles and you're located right here in Big Bend. If you continue 14 more miles, you'll come out in Hamburg. This is actually a 30-mile loop is what it is. But you're located right here in Big Bend, and as a crow would fly, you're about five miles away from the Red River. You're actually about four miles away from the Chafalaya River, or actually about eight miles away from the Mississippi River. If you ever heard the Mississippi River wants to change its course and go down to Chafalaya, well, this is a general area would happen in. Uh, Big Bend actually, the, the, the levee actually follows the bayou in Big Bend area, and the bayou is Bayou de Glass. It actually starts off where the old railroad bridge is in Sunsport, and it goes all the way to Cottonport, which is 46 miles of Bayou de Glass. Now, I'm going to tell you about the old iron bridge. The old iron bridge, well, it was completed in 1916 at a cost of $5,375. It failed to despair where it could not cross vehicular traffic anymore in 1988. In 1989, a group of citizens, including myself, got together and we decided we were going to try to get it placed on the National Register for the Preservation of Historical Places, which we did, being the first bridge in the state of Louisiana to be placed on the National Register. Uh, used to be a railroad line that came through here years ago. The name of the railroad line was called Louisiana Railway and Navigation Company. It was established by a man by the name of William Eatonborn. Mr. William Eatonborn left Germany. He got off into the steel business. He made big money in the steel business. In fact, he's credited for inventing barbed wires we know as you take, and later decided to get off into the railroad business. He created a railroad line that went diagonally across the state of Louisiana. Uh, from Shreveport going to New Orleans, or as we know it today, as the Kansas City Southern Railway Line. Well, when Mr. Eatonborn's railroad line came through, he was the man that was responsible for naming several of the towns and communities in this general area. Uh, he's the one who named Hesmer. Hesmer was actually his wife's maiden name. He's the one who named Zimmer. Uh, he's the one who named Rexmer. And of course, the name of the depot that was located at the edge of the woods right here was called Sarto. Sarto Depot, Sarto. Uh, uh, Lane, Sarto, so Sarto Iron Bridge. So that's actually how the bridge got its name. Um, his uh, railroad line crossed the road about a fourth of a mile down from here, going south, and it would uh, go about five miles into the woods to where the Red River actually stops being a Red River and it starts being a, uh, the Chafalaya River. Well, there was a plantation that was located there. The name of the plantation was called Water Valley Plantation. Water Valley Plantation was established by the Michael Haney family. It later became known as Naples. And the reason it later became known as Naples is because most of the immigrants working on the railroad line were of Italian descent, and it belongs to their hometown of Naples. So they renamed it Naples. Naples no longer exists. Naples during his heyday, though, had a population of about 250 people. There was three boarding houses, one hotel, four fish markets, a schoolhouse, a Baptist church, and three general stores that were located at Naples. Naples got washed away during the 1927 flood and had never been rebuilt. Big Ben, Big Ben was a thriving little community back in the early 1900s. Of course, Big Ben was more heavily populated because most people farm like a little 10, 20 acre tract of land. And of course, they raise uh, livestock and animals and stuff, uh, like chickens and different things like that. Anyway, we'll make a living. But uh, Big Ben had a cotton gin, a blacksmith shop, sawmill, syrup mill, smokehouse, and also a moss gin. 
people used to harvest Spanish moss back then, and it was pretty much dried and clean the same way as what cotton was. But what it was used for, if you cut the seed open in this 1939 Ford truck, you would not have found foam because foam wasn't invented, and of course you would not have found cotton. Cotton was considered a precious commodity and only used for clothing back then. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Crew had a wonderful business making cross ties at Naples and also a general store in this general location. Mr. Barn Lemoyne. Mr. Barn Lemoyne was postmaster prior to Mr. Adam Monte. Mr. Barn Lemoyne is credited for building this building right here. This building right here was actually built in 1927. This building is unique in a way because if you look at it, it has no two by fours. It's just the boards and, of course, the metal that's on the outside. It does all right in the summertime, but come the wintertime, it gets mighty darn cold in here. Mr. Adam. Mr. Adam was the last man to be postmaster over here. He was postmaster over here for some 46 years, and he decided to go ahead and close the grocery store part of it down on April 30th, 1994, when the United States government took the post office out of postal service back then. He passed away in 1995. In 1996, his son donated this to the Tourist Commission of Avalos, and on March 1st, 2001, as we opened this up as a museum. Churches. Well, Bayou Glass Baptist Church, about a mile and a half north of here. St. Michael's Catholic Church, located in Rexham, about three miles north of here. And, of course, St. Peter's Catholic Church, located in Barlowville, about eight miles north of here. The Great Flood of 1927. Well, the Great Flood of 1927 actually changed the whole history of this area. It destroyed the railroad line that came through here, which was never rebuilt after the 1927 flood. And, of course, it caused a lot of hardship on people that were located living in this general area. I told you the building, this building right here was built in 1927 because the flood was destroyed the one before. When it destroyed many people's homes and stuff, destroyed a lot of our livestock. And, uh, it was hard times on people back then. I was told the only thing the government did for the people back then is to provide them some tents to live in in Mansura, which was Granny Car area. And of course, when the water went away, the government gave them a hoe and some cabbage seeds and told them, make it the best way you can, yon, yon. Uh, Last school, Barlowville High School, they closed down in 1988. There was two plantations located over here. That was the Kleinwood Plantation and the Rexmer Plantation. Well, the Kleinwood Plantation, most of the acreage on it has been sold off. But the big white house known as the Blakewood House is still there. The one having the most interesting history of the two was the Rexmer Plantation. The Rexmer Plantation was a true plantation to the fact that if you lived on Rexmer Plantation, you worked at Rexmer Plantation. And if you worked at Rexmer Plantation, you were paid with Rexmer Plantation currency. And you spent it at the Rexmer Plantation commissary. There was no need to go anywhere else, or maybe you couldn't go anywhere else. But it had the most interesting history of the two. One of the owners was actually Roy C. Woods. He was a United States Senator from Illinois, and he was also the attorney for the gangster Al Capone. Al Capone used to come and hide out of the Rexmer Plantation to get away from lawmen that were after him. Al Capone was running a bootlegging business from Terrebonne Parish on through Avalos, through Hot Springs to Chicago, is, is what he was doing. Now, this is some scenes of the before and the after. This is Mr. Adam right here, and this is old Barrett. Now, uh, they say old Barrett's still around here, so I really don't know, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, we have, uh, this is the unveiling the historical side back on uh, April 29, 1990. This is a picture of the Rikuli General Store that was located in Naples. Uh, this is Mr. Rikuli right here who was the proprietor of the general store, and he was also the undertaker over there. Uh, this is some scenes of the church fair that takes place in Bartlesville. Uh, every in the middle part of September whether it's the 15th falls on the Saturday and the Sunday or the 21st it's always the middle part of September it's a very family oriented church fair there's plenty of cracklings boudin jambalaya plenty of homemade cakes with plenty of yum yum in between and of course uh, we uh, usually end the meal on Sunday with a caution delay meal as you can see all the roast pigs that are cooking right there so uh, come visit us but uh, anyway uh, there's one more thing that's unique about the Vivalls Parish. Vivalls Parish is actually one of the furthest northern parishes in the state of Louisiana that's actually French. Now the reason we're French is because most of the people who ended up settling in the Vivalls Parish came in through the river system and then settled among the different banks of the different bayous and stuff like that. And of course they spread out. And, and the reason it's so 
uh, familiar is because you could probably pick up a telephone book. The common names over here are Barlon, Maya, Desel, Rabelais, Norman, Dozal, Lashnan, all Lemoyne. All these names are, are actually common to Evolve's Parish. And like I said, you could pick up a telephone book in, in Flagstaff, Arizona and find a Barlon, Maya, Norman, or Rabelais, and chances are they'll know somebody who is from Evolve's Parish. But not to get us confused with the people from South Louisiana who are, are also French spoken. Well, those are the Acadian. Those are the people who left Nova Scotia and ended up settling in South Louisiana. Uh, and that's where you run into the names like Boudreau, Thibodeau, LeBlanc, and names like that. You know, uh, and if you spoke French in a false parish and you went to speak French to somebody that lives per se, Opelousas, Ville Platte, or whatever, you'll notice the French dialect is just a little bit different, and that's the reason why. We found this in the attic of this building, really. And what makes this so much interesting, this was the old money on the receipts that were from Naples back then. And the coolest part about it is somebody had to sign for this. Yeah. And so this is a paper trail. And look the post date, 1926. That was before the 1927 flood. And you remember your grandma's old coat boxes? Yep. Can you still remember them? Oh yeah. Get a, get a picture of that motor on that machine. Yeah, make sure you, you show that machine good. Yeah, it's actually not a gas, it's not a gasoline motor, it looks like. A coal or whatever. You know you can still get parts for that thing? What? Yes indeed. I had a guy from uh, New York City that came over here and he told me, he came look at it, he said, you know you can get parts for that yet? And I said, you kidding? And he told me, he says, uh, uh, yeah. So he, he went and he made different print schematics of it and stuff and he sent it to me and he told me where you could order the parts and stuff for it. Uh, I've been meaning to get somebody to look at it and uh, see about fixing it, but uh, I just haven't had the chance to find a, the right mechanic to look at it and, and fix it and stuff. But uh, it was really interesting that uh, you could repair it if you wanted to. From 1929. So there you go. This is just a really neat little old store. I love it. I love this old stuff. Um, if you find yourself in the area, come check it out. He'll show you how to work the old traps. He'll show you how to work all the old uh, simple living devices that they have out here. Um, rather you're interested in, in trains, there's train history here and the post office aspect of it in the old general store, or just the simple living aspect of the old devices and merchandise that's still in here. It's a great learning place. It's a good place to bring young kids and you know show them some of the simpler, older ways that are sometimes a lot better. And it's a great place for older people to come and reminisce you know, like I said, I grew up in an old country store that my grandmother ran. I grew up on this bayou in another location further down. So I enjoyed this old history, and I hope that you guys did too.